Family breakdown has enormous consequences for the well-being of children, especially if they're being exposed to parental conflict. When a child is caught in the middle of a custody battle, how does this affect his ability to learn and function well at school? That's the subject of today's episode of Family Matters. Separation and divorce are difficult. You have rights. We fight for them. Why do people hire family lawyers? The most important reason is to protect their children. I'm John Schumann, the head of the family law group at Debbie Smith Frank. Clients also want to protect themselves, protect their finances, and plan for their future. Contact me at 416 416- 446-5847 or at www.devrylaw.ca We will protect and guide you. At the Watson Gopal Family Law Group, our focus is to work with our clients to keep costs, conflict, and emotional stress low while trying to achieve favorable legal results. Our lawyers are skilled in traditional family law litigation, but we pride ourselves on promoting innovative out-of-court options such as mediation, arbitration, collaborative law, and parenting coordination. Your family law issues are unique, and our approach reflects that. Watson Gopel, contact us today. Children who are caught in the middle of warring parents can have great difficulty concentrating and learning at school. What can be done to insulate children from the stress of being raised by parents whose hatred for each other puts them in the middle of a tug of war. How can we maximize children's performance at school and prevent learning difficulties as a result of being emotionally harmed by witnessing their parents behaving badly? Our guests today are well qualified to answer those questions and we're going to start with an internationally renowned psychologist and author who has dedicated his career to helping parents and children cope with the sometimes devastating consequences of high conflict, divorce and separation. Dr. Richard Warshak. Welcome, Dr. Warshak, to Family Matters. Thank you. I want to just hold up for our viewers your book, Divorce Poison, which is really the Bible when it comes to setting out all of the implications that can arise when two parents who separate can't manage to keep their children out of the dispute. Yes, and that that book describes the parents who really do the worst job of it. Uh, But even the parents who are doing a better job of it, they send their children to school and the children are tense and they reflect the tensions of the parents. Young children are clingy, they want to sit on the teacher's lap, they don't concentrate well. The older children are angry usually and they uh, sometimes the children themselves are you know, brought into the tug of war as you mentioned and when that happens they may be demonizing a parent, uh, they don't want that parent showing up at school activities, they try to badmouth the parent to teachers and counselors. Sometimes the school gets a very negative impression of one of the parents. I've noticed that, that some parents actually lure the school into the dispute and try to gain them as an ally. Yes, they get sucked in. It's like a tribal warfare and you've got to take sides. It's best for the school to stay out of that. The the kids need a neutral place, a place that's a free from the war. A safe haven. A safe haven. What do you say to parents who say, yes, we argue, we fight, Uh, our children were too young, they wouldn't remember it, they don't understand it, it doesn't affect them? The children over here so much more than the parents think they do, and the children also pay attention to the gestures and the tone of voice that the parents use when they talk to each other, when they talk to Uh, to other people about the parent who's not in the home anymore. Uh, Even kids who are too young to understand the words, they can pick up on the tension. So what, uh, you're you're the mental health expert here. In terms of a clinical uh, operation that's going on here, 
What is it about being exposed to parental hostility that affects a child's ability to learn at school? It's very stressful for children because they're used to the parents shielding them, protecting them from stress, and instead it's the parents' own behavior that's generating all the tension. So the kids go to school and their behavior and their learning is a barometer of how much tension have they been exposed to at home. And so they try to either, either they're preoccupied with it, they can't get it off their minds, or they try to seal over it and forget about what the fight they heard the night before. But it's not easy just to seal over part of your brain activity. So when you're trying not to think about the fight, you're also having difficulty paying attention to what the teacher is saying. Do you think schools do a good job of managing children like that? Because, you know, we see ADD, ADHD being thrown around all the time when it comes to kids caught up in this conflict. Uh, it seems like an easy label. It's an easy label and sometimes it's a mistake because kids who are anxious and depressed will also have the difficulty paying attention that children who have ADD show. And the difference though is that these children are inconsistent in their attention. It's a more of a barometer of the tensions at home. And, and they, once they are taught how to handle those feelings, their concentration improves, their behavior improves. Uh, so they it's, they're functioning at schools episodic. And I think the teachers, it, for the most part, do their best, but they need help from the parents. The teachers need to be kept informed about what's going on at home. They need to know about major changes when a parent moves out of the house or when the home is sold. Sometimes parents don't even think to let the school know about these events. So you have the two extremes. Some parents try to get the school involved and turn the school against the other parent, and then other parents don't keep the school involved at all and they're operating in a vacuum and they don't know what's going on with the children. They don't know what's going on, so if the child is acting up, they, they, the teachers won't respond sympathetically because they don't realize what the child's struggling with. You know, it seems to me then that the converse argument can be made. I'm just thinking of what I get in court. Some parents will say, my child's getting great marks at school. That proves that this child isn't affected at all by the, uh, by the breakup. It, well, it's ironic for some children investing themselves in school as a way to avoid all the conflict at home. So they concentrate on school and they try to do their very best. They try to be perfect. Sometimes they want to be perfect hoping that that will help the parents get back together again. Really? Uh, yes, yes. The children feel responsible for the breakup and they feel that if they, if they were better, then the parents would have hung in. Because some of the parents' arguments might have been involved with how, they, how each parent treated the child. They may have disputes about the best way to manage a child's behavior. What do you say to parents who say that they can't uh, trust the other parent to help with the homework, they don't want the other parent at the parent-teacher interview, they want to be the one to manage the education, the other parents should keep out of it. This has a devastating long-term effect for kids. We know from a lot of research that the more both parents are involved in school activities, the higher the child's grades, the better the child's behavior. So if dad is marginalized, for example, and he's not welcome at the parent-teacher conferences, that child, the, the odds are now being stacked against that child. So both parents need to respect that they may have different styles of dealing with schoolwork and, and with the child, but they both need to be encouraged to remain involved. Sometimes we see parents who ask the court to order that they can go and visit their child at school. Uh, do you ever agree with that? Well, each case has to be decided, you know, on its own basis. But, but generally, it seems for, to me that you should be at school to learn, not to be visiting with parents. It's school is, as you say, it's a nice safe haven. It's a demilitarized zone. So usually for older children, it's better for the parents not to be just showing up during the day at school. For younger children, though, it might, might be a nice thing for them to have a you know, parent join them for lunch that sort of thing. You do want pa parents involved in the activities though in terms of uh, showing up at the, at the sports events and, and other events. Well I want to thank you very much Dr. Warshak for taking the time to be with us. When we come back after the break we will hear from a high school principal. Don't go away. Justice Brownstone's wardrobe is provided by DG Bremner & Company, a luxury sportswear retailer for men. Visit dgbremner.com Separation and divorce are difficult. You have rights. We fight for them.
Hello, I'm Michael James O'Connor. Family law requires sensitivity, flexibility, and confidentiality. The lawyers at McConnell and Beyond O'Connor and Peterson are trained to use all avenues available, including alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and litigation. Our family lawyers are equipped to handle your needs in a sensitive and positive way. We can help. Please call. Welcome back to our discussion of children at school experiencing high conflict parents. I'm pleased to welcome a principal who has 40 years experience as an educator, Jean Bigelow. Jean, welcome to the show. My pleasure. I would imagine that you have seen some horrible situations in your career with children who have been victimized by parental conflict. It's tough. It's really hard to watch. We see um, little children coming to school and sharing and talking about not being able to sleep at night because mommy and daddy were fighting and shouting all night. We have um, children whose parents are in the middle of a divorce or have been divorced for some time who are in huge conflict with each other and the children come to school and what we notice is highly aggressive behavior where the children act out in a number of different ways. Um, I've heard of situations where their children are throwing rocks at each other, beating up on each other. They're highly defended and against vulnerability and they just have to act out because of the frustrations and, and horrible stuff that's happening at home. Why do you think they get aggressive? Because I hear it too. I hear children beat up on teachers. Because they're trying to take charge of their life. Their life is so out of control and they have no way of organizing and having someone look after them because the parents are so busy being in conflict, they're not really caring for their children in the best way possible. So the children are trying, they really are looking out for themselves and to do that you have to take an alpha role and that often translates into huge aggression because the kids don't understand what's happening. And what about the learning? I would imagine that it's children who are so distressed and stressed are not really at their optimum learning capacity. That's right and, and they're coming to school having ill um, treatment at home in many cases. The parents are playing them off against each other and we're expecting them to focus and concentrate on their math. It, it doesn't work. The kids are distracted. They are often caring for themselves a lot because the parents are otherwise engaged and they're involved in um, video games and TV and internet and that's who's raising our children in many cases and, and so the kids come to school, they can't focus, high degree of distractibility and it just doesn't work for their learning at all. I hear as well in court that a lot of children who are uh, exposed to long-standing protracted parental conflict have ADD or ADHD. Do and you, you see that correlation? I think you do. I think I can. I mean, we see it in other situations as well, but certainly when things are not, when home is not a safe haven and the child does not see, feel cared for and protected, they are distracted and they are dealing with ADD and other things and total lack of focus at school. Yeah. And so when you talk to parents, uh, do you get the same answer I get, which is, look, I'm great. It's the other parent that's the problem. All the time. All what do you time. say to them? I, I say it, it takes two. You know, it, you really have to look at what you do. And I, and I counsel them on how to support the child's relationship with the other parent. Because if you can parent together, your child will be fine if there's a split. And never malign the other parents. Never ask the uh, child to choose between the two of you for what you know you want to do or how things are going to go because it makes the child have divided loyalties and it never works for the child. Do you think that parents uh, get that message from you? For example, do they come to parent-teacher interviews together? Uh, sometimes they do. When a parent split has worked well, the parents come together and can come to all school events. It's what I suggest and ask of parents. Sometimes parents can't be in the same room as the other parent for whatever reason, and it doesn't work very well. So we have to go to um, the different lengths, and we will have separate interviews at our school for each parent. But really, it's great to hear the message from the teacher 
together so that you can parent together. And that's the best possible outcome. And parents kind of need to get over themselves and, and do that if they can. How do you suggest they do it? You know, I, I see parents in such distress, such pain, and they say to me, I, you know, I can't deal with this other person. I know I'm supposed to, but I can't cope with the anger and the, and the pain that they cause me. And I'm having great difficulties communicating even over simple things like who's going to pick up the child from school. Yeah, it's a tough one. And, you know, in terms of the activities at school, parent-teacher interviews and those things, rely on the school to, to tell you the goods about your child and give you the same information. And, the, and nothing will happen in those interviews. You need to be here to support your child and put your conflict aside, if you can, to parent the child together because that's going to be the healthiest, best situation for the child. And do you tell parents what you're seeing in terms of the children's behavior and what's likely to happen to their, their whole course of education if they don't somehow insulate their children better from the conflict? Well, I tell them, and it's a hard one to hear. It's a hard, parents have a hard time hearing it because there seems to be, in some cases, a big investment in having that conflict continue and it and the, you mean an emotional investment a huge emotional investment and the only one that really gets hurt in the end is the child well I couldn't agree more I hope that parents have listened carefully to what you're saying because uh, I see it every day in my courtroom and I think that without an education it's very hard to build the foundation of a successful life mm -hmm. so I want to thank you so much for being here my pleasure coming up after the break we will go in chambers with parent and teacher Pina Ferraro stay with us People often ask the family lawyers at Debbie Smith Frank if we can protect their rights without going to court. We know how to get people the results they want through mediation, arbitration, or collaborative law, often without the stress and hostility. Our full service firm will protect you, your children, and your finances in or out of court. Contact us at 416 446 5847 or online at www.devrylaw.ca. Hello, I'm Michael James O'Connor. Family law requires sensitivity, flexibility, and confidentiality. The lawyers at McConnell & Beyond O'Connor & Peterson are trained to use all avenues available, including alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and litigation. Our family lawyers are equipped to handle your needs in a sensitive and positive way. We can help. Please call. Welcome back to Family Matters. We are now in chambers with a teacher, Pina Ferraro, with 15 years experience dealing with young children at school. Pina, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I would imagine that with breakup rates being what they are, you must have encountered many students whose parents are in the middle of high conflict divorces and separations. Yes, uh, unfortunately, many of our students come to us with a lot of issues at home, uh, high parental conflict, and it's something we see and deal with uh, each and every day. How do you ever find out that uh, a child is uh, caught in the middle of a parental conflict? Do they come right out and tell you this? They don't normally come out and tell us. Uh, what will happen is a teacher will notice uh, the student getting withdrawn, um, having starting to have difficulties learning, their attention, their focus. Sometimes with younger kids it comes out in a drawing. Sometimes it comes out inadvertently through a discussion with older kids. It normally comes out through a, a journal entry. And do the children then tell you that there's trouble at home? If you will inquire, they won't expand on it. I think they feel a sense of loyalty to the home. So they won't give you details. Um, and you have to be really careful about probing them as well. Now when you see a, a student who has been in, in the middle of a tug of war for a long time, uh, how does this affect their learning at school? Oh, it affects their learning in a, in a great profound way. As I said, they become withdrawn. They are hard to motivate. What about uh, the learning though? The learning, they'll have trouble picking up new concepts. Uh, their attention isn't there. Their self-confidence isn't there. Do you see aggressive behavior? 
That's a main issue as well. Because um, I see parents in court telling me that the school is calling saying that the children are out of control, they're aggressive with other kids. That is true. I had a grade one student who um, all of a sudden just started hitting his, his peers in line, kicking. Um, so these kids are angry. Oh, they're very angry. They're confused. When you discover that a child has disclosed to you that mom and dad are fighting over, over me, uh, what contact do you have with parents over that? Uh, basically, what you do is you call, I would call the parents in and ask, request that both parents come in and disclose what I've observed, to explain what my concerns are, and then point blank ask, what is going on at home? And when they tell you, well, we're having some problem, we've recently separated, uh, the kids are not handling it well, or maybe they blame each other for whatever the pro child's problem is, what do you do? What do you say to them? Well, um, as a parent, and uh, to see what the child's going through is basically let them know that they need to put their feelings aside and put their child's interest uh, ahead of their own. Do you ever get through, do you think? I think so. Sometimes we do. Do you see improvements with these kids when you speak to the parents? Uh, mostly, yes. And the other thing we do is we'll uh, have them access community resources that are available that they may not be aware of. So either support, maybe therapies that are available, anything we can do to help them. Do you talk to the children about it? When, you, when a child tells you that he or she feels very conflicted, they're caught in a, in a conflict of loyalties between the parents, do you counsel children too? Is that something that teachers do? You ha as a teacher, we're not exactly trained to counsel or to provide therapy, so we need to be very careful. I think we are sensitive and we try to guide them just to reassure them that uh, they are, it, whatever's happening at home, it's not their fault. That's a big that, one, isn't it? Yeah, I get definitely. the sense that so many kids think they've done something wrong to cause this. I've heard it. I've heard them saying, if I'm a better girl or if I'm a better boy, mommy and daddy, maybe they won't fight. And It's heartbreaking. I've had to explain to them, it's not your fault. You've done nothing wrong. This is something your mommy and your daddy are going to have to figure out. Your job is to come to school and to learn and to do well. And I think that uh, some parents may not know that the, the law actually applies here. If you see a situation going on for some time and a child seems to be acting out and showing great distress to the point where you think that child is actually being emotionally harmed, you've got legal obligations. Every teacher does, don't they? Oh, absolutely. Uh, at the end of the day, our obligation is to contact Child Protection Services if we feel that there is a need to, and we do. And that, that, then they come to the school and they might interview the child. Absolutely. And I think people need to know, have you had cases where a child ends up in foster care? I have not personally, no. I have heard of cases such as that, uh, not myself personally. I have had uh, Child Protective Services come to the school where we've had to withdraw the student and uh, have a conversation with the agency. You've also, I'm sure, uh, had cases where parents have come to the school and fought over the child right at the school. I've had parents show up demanding to see their children. I've had parents trying to remove their children. You mean take them out of class? Mm -hmm. What happens? Uh, well, basically, uh, they don't hopefully make it past the office uh, where at that point the administrator will clarify who has custody and who has access and we've had to call in uh, police. I guess it's important for parents out there to notify the school, give the school a copy of their court Absolutely. order so that the school knows who's got custody, when is the access, who's supposed to pick up this child at the end of the day. Because I know in court I'm asked often to make these orders mm -hmm. uh, and to specify for the school who they can release the child to. Absolutely. I guess the job of a teacher can become complicated when you've got these kinds of things going on behind the scenes. I've had a case where I had a student whose father was incarcerated for having abducted the student. From the school? Not from the school. This was previous to the, uh, the student joining the school and when the student, during the course of the school year, that father was released from prison. I had to ensure my doors were locked at all times, I had to lower my blinds and I had a picture of him so that I knew who I was looking out for. Sounds like the job of a teacher is a lot more than teaching the three R's. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. Well, oh, thank you for having me. When it's hard to meet or even talk together, put the power of computer software and trained negotiators to work for you. 
lawyers, mediators, and families can harness Smart Settle software to produce high value agreements for separation, estate, and elder care. Smart Settle software can help parties reach an agreement worth 10 to 20% more value for everyone. Get connected. Get smart. Get settled. Learn more right now at smartsettlefamily.com. It can be difficult to talk with family about estate planning at the best of times. Many families don't talk enough about the issues they face, such as remarriage or the family business. Hi, I'm Jim Doyle. I help navigate the complexities of today's modern family when it comes to integrating your investment and legacy planning needs. Wouldn't it be nice to see your professional advisors speaking to you with a common voice? When protecting your legacy is important, ask how Jim Doyle and Investors Group can help. Hi, I'm Lauren McLean. Today on Q&A, our question is, I'm divorcing after a long marriage. Doesn't my wife have to become self-sufficient? This question may be the most asked question I get as a family lawyer. It's also a frequent source of heated debate in many family cases. Courts have clarified that a failure to achieve self-sufficiency is simply one factor to take into account when determining entitlement to and the appropriate amount of that spousal support. There's no absolute obligation or duty to become self-sufficient, only to make reasonable efforts towards this. The courts will look at your wife's education, her health, skill set, and employment history. I say courts should encourage paying spouses to remain working to their full capacity, rather than slacking off or quitting their jobs to try to pay less support. And similarly, the court should ensure recipient spouses do not refuse to work or retrain so that they can languish at home to try to get more support. In today's uncertain economy, ensuring both spouses work to their full capacity is best for them and our community as a whole. Thanks for watching. For extended interviews and exclusive content, please visit our website at familymatterstv.com. If you'd like to submit your legal question to our Q&A, go to advicescene.com. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. See you next time.